Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kevin Minofu. I'm the Research Director at the Center of Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies. I'm excited to welcome you to this event. Um, it's uh, very, uh, I guess it's kind of weird being back here. I'm a former student of the law school as an LLM student uh, not too many years ago. Um, and it's great to be back for our first end of the Black Light conversation um, at our home at Columbia University. Um, uh, I'll just to give a little background about our end of the Black Light series. We started this series when the COVID pandemic uh, initially hit. And the, the, the first response, as people said, was that COVID would be the great equalizer. Um, as that turned out, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And an, inter an intersectional and critical race understanding helped us understand why that was wrong. Um, that intersected with the sec, what we call the two twin pandemics of white supremacy and the killing of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. Um, uh, since then, our conversations have included about the crisis in our democracy, um, the, the attack on critical race theory and anti-racist education. So I'm excited to welcome you to this conversation. I'm going to introduce Professor Kelly Jones, who's a professor um, uh, of the African American Studies Department and the chair, actually, excuse me, um, to introduce our panelists to this conversation. And hope you enjoy. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to Columbia University. I am Kelly Jones, Chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies, and thrilled to host this event with the African American Policy Forum. African American and African Diaspora Studies is a vibrant intellectual enterprise that has transformed the way we think about the United States and the world. The scholarship produced by these fields has enhanced and transformed disciplines throughout the social sciences and the humanities. At Columbia, the teaching of this interdisciplinary field goes back a century. At this time in the history of our university and our nation, African American and African diaspora studies plays a vital role in training students to be engaged and inform global citizens conducting research that helps us foster a greater understanding of the challenges that confront us and building and sustaining strong community ties, both within and outside of Columbia University. We welcome you to this forum tonight and stand against forces that would restrict access to this body of knowledge. And we affirm that our scholarship continues to and will always explode racial strictures and covenants. Thank you. I'm excited to introduce uh, our moderator for this today's panel and one of our great friends at APF and at CISPUS, uh, Professor uh, Danny Hosang, Daniel Hosang, excuse me, and who's a professor um, at Yale University. Great, okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Okay. Welcome uh, under the black light. I want to send, you know, greetings and grace to all the people watching. Also, we're going to watch this event recorded. I want to say a little something about the format and I'll get to introduce um, our amazing colleagues. So as uh, Kevin said, under the black light started um, and Kim and the African American Policy Forum actually designed a very specific format that would put people into conversation with one another. And that there was a politics to that, because we remember just a couple of years ago during COVID, wasn't sure, what, it was very hard to make sense of what was happening. And so the idea of bringing people from a range of places and disciplines and fields to try to think together about what's going on, that's very much what the aspiration of Under the Black Light is. And I'll just say that for tonight, this is a, a, an issue that we're gonna try to take up and wrestle with that one um, point of view, one site can't give us all the answers to. So we have my colleague Rod Ferguson, who's done really, really critical scholarship on student social movements, on black queer studies, queer of color critique, who's gonna help us think about what was at stake for a whole generation of people who demanded that the curriculum be transformed. We also, of course, are delighted to have Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Randy spends every day with classroom educators, bus drivers, people working in schools, trying to think about the conditions of their work and the conditions of their learning. We need and what it means to build strong unions. We have to think with that body of knowledge also. 
Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor at both UCLA and here at Columbia, has a long history in actually thinking about it's not just the, the, the relationship between the content, what education is for, and the kinds of world we're trying to build and what's at stake in those conversations. So I'll just say before we get into this, uh, I also work with an organization called the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective based in Connecticut. And we, we said at the beginning, all of us are teachers, all of us are learners, right? We're always teaching and learning. So there's a wide range of folks coming into this conversation who have diff grasps on different parts of this. And what we're trying to do in the next hour plus is to kind of collectivize what we see and understand so that we might move forward in a different way. Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome Randy, welcome Kim, welcome Rod, and we're gonna get started. Um, before I turn, and we're gonna do this in kind of rounds, so we'll stay in conversation with one another. I'm gonna turn uh, in, in a moment to the first round to Kim, but I just wanna say a little bit to try to get us on the same page about what we're talking about tonight, the AP African American History Curriculum, what's happened in the last month, um, uh, as a way to set up the conversation. So uh, AP classes are meant to replicate college level courses. I think there's 38 uh, AP classes now. They're um, administered, run and created by the College Board, which is a, a nonprofit. Uh, it also administers the SAT and standardized tests. And we'll, we'll get to that, right? And, just, and, and talk about that. Just responding to the audience. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, and the process for developing these classes is, and the process undertaken here, is to consult many, many college faculty, syllabi, instructors, to get a sense what's being taught here. Um, to do focus groups to figure out what the dominant themes in the field are, to put them together, to engage high school teachers in that process. They spent many years doing that, so that African American studies might finally join 38 other courses. And energized, of course, by the uprisings and the political motions in, in 2020. In January, Ron DeSantis and officials in Florida publicly insisted that the curriculum that was produced and the draft they saw that was 82 pages had no educational value. It violated the law and it was ahistorical. And then named a whole series of scholars, Professor Crenshaw, Professor Ferguson, Bell Hooks, Angela Davis, others. And they said what they have to teach, queer studies, feminism, intersectionality, critical race theory, no educational value. So I just wanna name that. They said, all the work you've been doing, it's garbage, it's trash. Given this, we might've expected some response when someone calls all the work you've done and it's not, it involved hundreds, right? Hundreds of thinkers. What might you have to say to that? What might you have to say to it when it comes from quarters that have witnessed constant bullying of public educators, faculty in Florida, their unions, et cetera. The college board said nothing. It simply announced that all these courses go through a process of revision. This course would go through a process of revision as well. And then released a final version that it excised almost all of that content and said it had nothing to do with politics. It simply had to do with process, just a matter of process. This is all a giant misunderstanding. So what we're gonna to do today is try to unpack that, what's at stake, to look closely and carefully at what was taken out of this curriculum, to think about what it means to teach black studies and black history without these concepts. Right, from a variety and the impact it'll have on teachers, students, etc. Okay. All right, Kim. <laughs> get our, um, so, one thing we know, and one thing under the black light conversations have always helped us think about is when we see these moments of conflict and crisis, they don't come out of nowhere. There's a history, there's a precursor, there's a set of conditions that give rise to them. So I wanna to turn to you first to help us think about what those conditions are, what's been happening in the last few years, such, and we'll return to this, it appears that the governor of Florida might have more say in what high school students are taught in relation to African-American history than colleagues here. How did we get here? Thank you, Danny. Um, and wow, it's great to be back. I haven't been here in a while, and it's just so wonderful to see so many of you here. And 
folks who are, are watching out there, welcome. Um, you know, there are so many beginnings to a crisis, right? We could start with um, the moment when President Trump uh, in the last debate, uh, when asked to repudiate the Proud Boys, instead said, stand by. And then a month later, he issued an executive order um, that effectively was the dream of the extremist right, the way that they have long thought and talked about what anti-discrimination law, what diversity, what inclusion policies were, which um, there's a, a, a billboard that my colleague Cheryl Harris took a picture of. It said, uh, diversity means seeking out the last white person. Um, there's basically an assumption, a belief, an articulation that has long been part of our society that any progress uh, for black people takes something away from white people. Any um, effort to demand any uh, reform uh, creates a, a sensibility among some that that advance is coming at their expense. This is, you know, not a new dynamic. We saw it uh, right after the Civil War was over and President Johnson vetoed the first Civil Rights Act as discrimination against white people. Um, we saw it after uh, the 19... Uh, 60s uh, movements in uh, which uh, President Nixon really, really played on the sensibilities uh, that um, civil rights had gone too far. Um, and we saw it uh, after the election of Barack Obama. So when President Trump issued an executive order, he created a, a, a framework in which all of the anti uh, uh, racist infrastructure uh, was placed under one container, and that container happened to be critical race theory. Now, he got this from somewhere. He, he didn't read enough to, to know that there was anything called critical race theory. Uh, but the idea uh, was that uh, a whole range of concepts from diversity, implicit bias, intersectionality, uh, the 1619 Project, um, feminism, uh, uh, diversity training, all of these were packaged together as a set of corrosive ideas that effectively discriminated um, against white people. That was the framework. Now, um, a lot of people disregarded uh, that because they thought it was an election uh, uh, gimmick, and in a certain way it was, but that under uh, that that misunderstood how deeply um, these kinds of uh, beliefs existed under the surface of so many uh, efforts to rally people around a discourse of grievance. Um, so yes, it was uh, eventually rescinded by uh, President Biden, but by that time the horse had gotten out of the barn and these uh, laws, copycat bills, spread across the country uh, through red states. They have uh, various uh, dimensions to them. They're basically called um, anti-CRT laws, anti-woke laws. Um, but what's important for people to understand is what these laws actually uh, prohibit. So um, they prohibit uh, any teaching um, that causes an individual to feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress on the count of uh, their race, color, sex, or national origin. Um, they prohibit any teaching uh, that suggests that merit, excellence, hard work, fairness, neutrality, objective, racial colorblindness um, were uh, created or function uh, as uh, ways to oppress members of another race. Florida's law um, prohibits the uh, teaching of American history as something other than the creation of a new nation based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Um, it goes on and on. There are some states uh, that prohibit uh, the teaching of structural racism, institutional racism, prohibit the teaching that racism is anything more than a departure uh, from our basic values, anything more um, than prejudice-based discrimination. Now, in those states, 
You might not even be able to teach disparate impact law because disparate impact law acknowledges um, that uh, racial discrimination is not necessarily or exclusively the product of prejudice. Now, what does all of this have to do with the college board's revised African American studies course? Well, that's partly what we're here to talk about, but I'll make a just, just a few suggestions. Number one, um, if you look at the um, uh, 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 preamble to the course, uh, it mentions things that were not in the first version of the course. Um, it talks about uh, AP opposes indoctrination. Where, where did that come from? Where did they get the sense that they had to wrap this course around a disavowal that conversation and teaching about race was indoctrination? It clearly is a reflection of the reality that now uh, race uh, studies have been framed as potentially uh, indoctrination. Here's clear evidence um, that uh, the background and the environment uh, was something they were aware of and needed to speak to in order to disabuse people uh, of concerns. They go on to say um, that students are not required to feel certain ways. And they are allowed to make up their own minds. They are not expected or asked to subscribe to any one specific set of cultural or political values. I really wonder if looking at the other AP courses, would you ever find anything like that? So um, I'll, I'll end just by saying that uh, there are various ways that the College Board could have responded to the last two years uh, of anti-wokeism and the way in which it has uh, mobilized uh, grievances and placed them inside uh, of anti-racist education. Some of those ways might have been to uh, uh, disapprove of censorship, disapprove of the use of legislation to try to dictate what can be taught and how people are supposed to feel could have been used to say we stand in favor uh, of, 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 of the uh, free expression uh, of knowledge. We are uh, embracing uh, the uh, idea that these courses are important because they help us make our democracy better. Those are all the things that could have been said. But as Danny said, there was silence about these anti-woke uh, laws and the first speaking to those anti-woke laws um, was embodied in this course and in this preamble. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim, kind of showing them in uh, how to get inside. Um, I want to take this now and turn to my colleague Rod. Um, and I just have to say it also, this is work that everyone at college level Black Studies turns to. It was incorporated in the curriculum, it was profoundly mischaracterized, and just left to stand, just left to stand. So Rod, uh, you found your name on this list of infamy. I just have this, I, I wonder if you were just like waking up, brushing your teeth, and then, uh, you, you know, there you are. Um, but you and your work on black queer studies was specifically cited by the Florida Department of Education to back its claim that the course had, quote, no educational value and could not be taught in Florida high schools in its current form. So then you wrote this very powerful response in the Chronicle of Higher Education, suggesting that the thinking from those officials may be along these lines, quote, maybe if we can prevent this course, we can keep new types of people from emerging because of it. So to set the scene for us here, what is Black Studies? What are its origins, origins and social movements? And, and, and an effort to prevent its full teaching, and what are the, quote, new types of people that it seeks to bring about? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, it's great to be here. Um, you know, in terms of, I've, first of all, I was in my sweats. <laughs> it was a Saturday, and I was having a latte, and I got an email from a reporter saying, look, your name's on this thing. Anyway, so, um, you know, if we go back to, you know, the sort of classic definitions, of black studies, you know, think here of CLR James's argument in um, what was published as a speech, Black Studies in the Contemporary Student. James said, black studies is the critique of Western civilization. 
Okay. If we go back to um, June Jordan's uh, essay, Black Studies Bringing Back the Person, about the open admissions movement um, at City College, she says that Black Studies is life studies. You know, it is a way of preserving the human. Okay. If we go to Cedric Robinson's, you know, large body of work, but also uh, Black Marxism, the making of the Black radical tradition, you know, he says that Black Studies is the rescue of the human from degradation, right? You think about also the uh, famed movements like the Lumumba Zapata movement at UC San Diego, the movement that occasioned the rise of a young graduate student in philosophy named Angela Davis, right? Um, you know, the movement here at Columbia, and one of the first things that students did here and in other places was to say that uh, we have to interrupt this program, the curriculum, the disciplines, English, history, they cannot be taught the way that they have been taught, right? And so simultaneously you had social movements calling for um, a redress of inequalities around race, around class, that were also then calling for a reorganization of knowledge, all right? So two things happening at the same time, right? An address to social injustice, but also an epistemological, you know, intervention in terms of the new types of subjects that in that moment um, that Black Studies gave birth to and that the Black social movements gave birth to, you know, it's uh, the Kumbahi River Collective. Uh, the Black Lesbian Feminist Socialist Group. It's also Marsha P. Johnson and Silvia Rivera uh, in Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Silvia Rivera says, I remember meeting Huey P. Newton, and he said through his article, his communique, Women's and Gay Liberation, that we are liberators and revolutionaries too, right? Um, there would be no modern you know, um, feminist movement in many ways without black studies, right? Um, the environmental movement, environmental justice movement has been changed because of Black Lives Matter, right? It is no longer permissible to talk about the environment uh, separate from issues of race. That is because of the impact of Black Lives Matter, right? Um, and so Toni Morrison uh, in her Nobel address, you know, described, um, and she, she might as well have been talking about black studies. She talked about it in term, language in terms of its midwifery properties, all right? We see that with black studies. It has been a midwife for other social struggles, for other critiques, you know, and so in many ways, the DeSantis uh, regime, and also the maneuver by the college board is designed to get rid of the midwife, you know? And that's what we have to be really concerned about, you know, that it is those efforts by accident or by intention, the convergence between the college board and uh, the right wing are designed the effect of them is to prevent new types of knowledges, new types of people, new types of struggles and frameworks from coming into being. You know, it's just, it's, it's such a, because I think we often, you know, they're trying to suggest that this is simply about a set of authors and they, now they're in section C and they were in section B. It's just a reorganization, find them online. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that what those authors stand in for mm -hmm. is something much, much more transformative. And it's actually not even about the authors. Mm -hmm. It's about a much longer genealogy. No, I'm all right. Yeah. You know, my back is all right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's not what's at stake. Yeah. It's not my person that is at stake. It is this, you know, the integrity of a transformative project that has changed the US, you know, and has the potential to continue to change the US. That's what's at stake. 
and one that in our moment of like profound crisis, we desperately, desperately need, yeah. desperately need, can't do without. Um, thank you, Rod. And I will look forward to kind of with you walking through what some of these changes are and the effects. I'm actually now gonna turn uh, online. We have our colleague, Paul Ortiz. And I just wanna, before I introduce you, Paul, are you there? Yes, yeah, loud, I can hear you loud and clear. All right, okay, so welcome. So Paul is a, a, a professor at the University of Florida. Uh, wrote a really, really important book, uh, A People's History of Black and Latinx, um, uh, uh, the Black and Latinx United States. It integrates and shows those histories were always wedded together. He's a leader in the struggle in Florida to protect uh, public education, faculty rights, teachers' rights. So, Paul, um, welcome. Uh, Paul, Florida, and we really wanted to get, you know, voices from Florida in here. So Florida has recently been described as a kind of laboratory or testing ground for a certain kind of authoritarian politics, authoritarian politics. And it's tricky because it's one in which these prohibitions are flying everywhere. Literally, books are being carted off the shelf kind of as we speak, but always in the name of protecting some group of people never for the power or benefit of the autocrat. So for those unfamiliar with this conception, can you paint a picture of what Florida has been like over the last few years and what kinds of laws and policies have been enacted? And also, because you always remind us of this, what were the movements and the campaigns that had been active um, before this uh, authoritarian turn? Well, thanks, Dan, and, and I'm just really honored to be able to, to join my distinguished colleagues. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but as you know, we are in crisis here in Florida. Um, I just uh, left an emergency union meeting. Governor DeSantis is going after the education unions right now, even as we speak. Um, I love how Roderick talked about Black Studies as a midwife for the movement, and it really is. Earlier today, I was talking to Naila Summers, who's one of my former students at the University of Florida. Naila took a lot of African-American studies courses at UF, and she's now the communication coordinator for the Dream Defenders. And many people know of the Dream Defenders as a courageous group of younger activists, the new abolitionists, if you will, who really came into being in the wake of the murder of Trayvon Martin, um, the, the Zimmerman verdict, and they occupied the state capitol. The Dream Defenders have been really at the cutting edge of new social movements in Florida. And this is what the state of Florida is striking against. Um, in July 4th, 2021, they passed the first anti-woke law. This was directed against public school teachers, K through 12 specifically. Unfortunately, too many people said, well, you know, it's just the public schools, it's just K through 12. Um, that was a grave error. A lot of the funding for DeSantis and this anti-woke legislation in the South comes from states like New York, comes from states like California. And because we've been at the center of the struggle to try to change this country, we've been targeted. And one of the things that's important to understand about that first anti-woke law was, and to echo what Professor Crunch Crenshaw mentioned was, it wasn't just attacking critical race theory, it was going even further in the sense that the first anti-woke law in Florida said that one was not even allowed to question the origins of this nation. In other words, we're supposed to pretend that the US was created equal. That's a myth, that's not true. It was, we were created unequal. And so these great movements like the Underground Railroad, the women's movement, the labor movement, these are the things that the anti-woke laws are designed to stop us from teaching and sharing with each other and with our students. And it's no accident that African-American studies has been attacked. It's no accident that the works of Toni Morrison, even as younger people in Florida are gravitating towards reading great authors like Toni Morrison, um, Alice Walker, Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison's works in particular are being targeted for banning. Why? Because she has a strong voice of memory. She talks about things like reparations. She talks about things like feminism. She talks about things like systemic inequality. And Dan, these are the things that we're not supposed to be talking about in Florida. These are the things that Governor DeSantis and the state, these are the discussions that the state of Florida is trying to stop. Um, we call this fascism here. And 
the good news is that we're holding strong. I mentioned the Dream Defenders. I mentioned, I just came to the United Faculty of Florida emergency meeting. We have a very strong FEA. I'm so glad that Randy Weingarten is here tonight. Um, our collective bargaining agreement right now is upholding intellectual freedom. And some of you may have, have remembered the Chris Busey grievance case. It was talked about in the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, last year extensively. Uh, Chris Busey and a number of colleagues in the UF College of Education wanted the right to continue pursuing critical race theory, continuing to use the best tools we have from African-American studies to understand inequality, and most importantly, to fight inequality, to challenge inequality, and to echo what Roderick said, to bring new people, to welcome new people into our society and make sure everyone is equal. And these are the tools that were being attacked, frankly. Uh, we filed a grievance, a union grievance. We won that case. And so we're using the collective bargaining agreement to promote ideas of equality quality and intellectual freedom. However, we are under siege. The state has made it clear that they're going to try to decertify the unions uh, in this upcoming legislative session in Florida. Well, thanks, Paul, for both, you know, the sober picture you're painting, um, but also the reminder of all the formations that have uh, stood against this. And, you know, your reference to Randy um, will invite us to turn to her now. I, I also just want to make a quick announcement that um, folks in the audience uh, can, uh, you can contribute to this conversation. So if you see on the screen, you'll see how to submit questions and queries through the Menti app, and we'll be integrating those into the conversation so we can get your questions in. Uh, Randy, let's turn to you. I, I just first want to say how grateful I think, you know, all of us are, um, because, you know, you've long helped people see that even you know teachers their unions their leaders who might think gosh we're just trying to protect the basics in our contract our staffing levels we're trying to ensure funding doesn't get cut you know these are important issues sure but they're, they're not really our issues you know and, and maybe they're kind of a distraction you've insisted that that's not the way to see them and, and you and you're with teachers every day so you've seen the impact can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing um, from that perspective i certainly can but i just want to um, we, we pulled together a couple of the tweets from the, yes, sorry, she's always taking care of me. <laughs> um, we pulled together a couple of tweets from the other side just to punctuate just how intentional this is. Um, this is a person who actually um, before Jonah Edelman and I did an op-ed together to basically say um, and to expose them, um, he was about to sue me for defamation. I uh, pushed back very hard because remember, I have resources. Mm -hmm. So I can, unlike others who don't have a union, mm -hmm. can push back hard. And I said, you sue me we get to do discovery mm -hmm. of all of what you do. So bring it on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I mean, maybe after tonight he will, but hasn't <laughs> yet. So this person, and I'll tell you the name in a minute, wrote about, this is two years ago. It's time to clean house in America, remove the attorney general, lay siege to universities, abolish the teacher unions, and overturn the school boards. Does that now sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you two other um, of his tweets, and then I will tell you what job he has right now. Mm -hmm. We have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Now this person who wrote all those tweets is now a trustee of the new college in Florida. It's Christopher Rufo. 
So I um, want to just say in the three minutes mm -hmm. that I have, yes, that's his picture, that there's nothing random about what they're doing. If you don't remember anything else I say, there's nothing random about what they're doing. And you have three people who are talking to you, who have broken through on there are our different areas of expertise, activism fight, two of whom have now been in some ways erased by the college board, and one of whom was called the most dangerous person in the world by a former Secretary of State. The smear is intentional to undermine. And so take that to the entire, that's why I read that first tweet, the entire group of teachers from pre-K to college, what do teachers try to do? They try to teach. They try to help children or young adults. Now, we're not perfect in any way, form, or manner, but teachers basically have no power without the collective, mm -hmm. without being part of a union. So that's why if that gives teachers power, and Danny is right, that I have tried to say, look, it is about public education as a common good, mm -hmm. as something that we all need to do. And we can hold in our arms the fact that we have to strengthen it, change it, make it better, and still believe in public education. And those two things we can do together. So what they're doing, and you see that this year, is they're undermining the tenets of that, just like any other authoritarian does. Two things authoritarians do when they start. They try to undermine knowledge, and the pursuit of knowledge and critical thinking. And the second thing they do is they ban and destroy books. And that is what we're seeing throughout the United States of America. Yunkin did it in one way. DeSantis is doing it in a more aggressive and egregious way. But that, you heard that, last thing I'll say is, you heard it last night in the response to the president's state of the union. That's their plan. So the question becomes, why would the college board, on a course that is an elective for high school students, seniors, basically, why would they intentionally or inadvertently walk right into, forget about DeSantis, mm -hmm. walk right into this whole um, push to undermine and erase knowledge by universities, by public education, the um, fight to ensure that the laws on the books are actually respected and to also go after the way in which public education is governed. There's nothing unintentional about what's going on. Thanks, Randy. And I think what, what's so important there is you're reminding us that there's pattern, right? Provocation and test, and then see, 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 see what might be um, what the response will be. And when the response is silence, you've been given the go ahead. Yeah. And, and that reverberates across, right? And, and we saw it again. We're, we're now gonna uh, look in a little more carefully, and I think we'll, we'll call the slides up now that allow us to look at some of the particular changes with gratitude to the staff at the African American Policy Forum, who've gone really carefully through these documents. Um, and the first slide that we're gonna look at says, um, what was expunged from the original learning outcomes? Thanks. So Rod, I want to turn to you. One learning outcome that was in the original framework, but has since been eliminated from the revised curriculum reads, quote, 
described the formalization of African American studies and new directions in the field as part of ongoing efforts to articulate black experiences, perspectives, and create a more just and inclusive future. So introduce students to the tradition, <laughs> tell them what it's been used for, and ask them how they want to use it. Don. Mm -hmm. okay. So, well, I mean, what would a course on African American studies look like if it didn't interrogate conditions like these? And I'll, I just want to bring in one more quote, you know. Uh, our colleague Robin Kelly, who's also named, uh, who teaches at UCLA in this, said in a recent interview that uh, the tradition of African American studies has, quote, really been about examining Black lives, the structures that produce premature death that make us vulnerable, the ideologies that both invent Blackness and render Black people less than human, and perhaps most important, the struggle to secure a different future. What is a Black studies course without that? It's not Black studies anymore. I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know, a Lawrence Welk African American studies, you know, of course, at that point, if you can't talk about the legacies of colonialism, slavery, uh, the systematic rape of black women, uh, if you can't talk about the devastations of migration um, to northern cities that, uh, as uh, one of the characters in Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust says, ain't going to be no land of milk and honey. If you can't talk about those things, you don't actually have black studies mm -hmm. at that point, you know, because you have so stripped, you know, a field, a discourse that has organized its reasons for being, again, around rescuing the human from degradation. Mm -hmm. If you can't talk about the things that degrade, you don't actually have black studies at that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you have something else, right? And for me, the danger in, um, there's a dangerous convergence here, all right? There's a convergence between the college board and its denuding of African-American studies, of the things that degrade, you know, and also um, the thrust and the push for social justice. You also then have um, right-wing forces that also wish to strip African American studies of the things that degrade. That's a dangerous convergence at that moment. It doesn't matter if, you know, one was pressured by the other. Even if we just had the college board doing that, it would be alarming enough. The problem is that we have the college board doing it and right wing forces calling for the same thing. That's a very dangerous and in many ways unprecedented moment for us, all right, where the, the field that was designed for the rescue of the human finds itself aligned with the fascist degradation mm -hmm. of human beings, right? right? That's a very, very dangerous moment that we're in. We are in a crossroads in terms of African American studies and Black studies right now. Right. And it is a crossroads that demands that we figure out ways to interrupt the social reproduction of cowardice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's what's at stake. If we don't say anything about this convergence, God only knows what's going to happen. And it's not going to stop with black studies. You know, it will continue to all the other subjects and knowledges that are midwifed and have been midwifed by black studies, right? So I just want to put that on the record. Yes. I think interrupting those, those norms, right, that, that cause these disavowals is so central to this. I want to turn now to Paul um, and ask you to Paul to reflect a little bit on another point here. It's the third item on this list, which reads, quote, uh, that a learning objective would be to evaluate the political, historical, aesthetic, and transnational contexts of major social movements, including their past, present, and future implications. And what's removed there is past, present, and future implications. Okay. Yeah. If they're successful in eliminating the evaluation of major social movements, not just to study them that they happened, but what were their implications? What were they trying to give and produce? 
What might they still produce? What is it that students wouldn't be able to learn, Paul? What is it that you as a teacher and others under this law wouldn't be able to teach? And how does this relate maybe to some of the movements you described earlier? Yeah. Well, Dan, this would have a devastating impact. And I want to emphasize again, the impact that it's already having on K through 12 education in Florida and other states. Um, many of my former students are teachers in the state of Florida. And what they share with me is quite shocking. And what they say is, Professor Ortiz, you know, I'm a teacher at Miami-Dade. I'm quitting. I'm leaving the state because I can't even mention the date 1619 publicly because someone might accuse me of teaching the 1619 curriculum, which is illegal in Florida. Some of the K through 12 teachers I know, Dan, say I'm not even going to use the term race in class in high school social studies because someone might accuse me of teaching critical race theory. And all it takes is one accusation. And, and we're living in a fascist time, Dan, and teachers are being fired. In higher education, a lot of faculty are terrified. I wanna emphasize that because of our collective bargaining agreement, I'm not changing a word of my syllabus. I've taught African diaspora in the Americas for many years. I've taught Franz Fanon, I've taught Kimberly Crenshaw, I've used Toni Morrison. I'm not changing any of that. But again, I'm relatively privileged. I have a collective bargaining agreement. And as long as I have that art, that article of academic freedom, I can do those things. But the devastating implications for our students is that Florida, as you know, and I'll just kind of drill down into Florida here for a minute. Florida has a very traumatic, powerful, tragic, but inspirational racial history. It proves that the United States was not created equal. Black Seminoles had to fight for generations for their freedom. We had the Rosewood and Ocoee Election Day massacres, and many people have, have learned about those in recent years. What these laws mean, if they are cemented and if they are affirmed, and if no one fights back against them, is that our students will remain ignorant of racial trauma. They'll remain ignorant of the movements like Black Lives Matter. And I think this was, it was no coincidence, Dan, that Black Lives Matter was a major target um, in the banning of African-American studies. And even the mention of Black Lives Matter throws people like Ron DeSantis and the leading reactionaries in Florida into a literal rage. They don't wanna hear it because what it means is younger people joining with older movement activists. It means people having these conversations about the continuing inequalities. It means about people having conversations in classrooms at the University of Florida, at Florida A&M University, at FSU, having conversations about mass incarceration, having conversations about the continuing legacies of slavery, having conversations about the possibility of reparations due to slavery. And this is what's at stake. If Governor DeSantis has his way, then we will no longer be able to have these conversations. And so on the one hand, we won't be able to talk about the horrific traumas like Rosewood, like the Ocoee massacre, like lynching. And by, by the way, Florida had the highest per capita lynching rate in the entire nation, higher than Mississippi, higher than Alabama. If we allow DeSantis to win, if we allow this banning of AP African-American studies to stand down, we're going to lose the ability to learn these basic facts of history, not only how Florida had the highest per capita lynching rate in the country, but how we had some of the most courageous and robust NAACP chapters in Florida that met secretly, that fought against lynching, that fought for equity in education in the 1920s, in the 1930s. So no, the country was not created equal. We were created very unequal. In African-American Latinx history of the U.S., I say that in the U.S., settler colonialists used the whip, the gun, and the U.S. Constitution to enforce inequality. The question is, how have we become a more equal society? How far do we need to go? And those are conversations that we have to keep alive in classrooms, Dan, because once those conversations stop, then fascism wins. Yeah, Paul, and those those examples you're saying in this passage, past, present, and future implications, to study those as events without thinking about their implications is precisely what's at stake here. I want to, uh, Randy, turn to you. You know, in our discussions, I learned that 
you know, as a teacher, you taught AP government, right? So this is, you know, partly in your kind of backyard here. You know, curious about, you know, many of these kind of excisions focus on content, but also on pedagogy, on how, how to teach, what students can learn, what can be said. And I want to invite you to kind of react to that from a teacher's perspective. What does it mean when teachers are told what, what, kind of what they can and to what ends uh, education is for? Um, uh, it's terrible. I, I don't know. So think about in any kind of circumstance that any of you are in, where you ask somebody a question and they freeze because they don't know if they're going to get in trouble answering the question. And that is essentially what every teacher in Florida is going through this year. Um, it's there's us when there, Rand just did a report, a big survey of teachers, and their conclusion was that people are walking on eggshells, which they are. So, you know, I can say what Paul did. One of the reasons um, that uh, I got in big trouble with the right wing was two years ago, I said to teachers all throughout America that if you get in trouble for teaching honest history, the union will have your back. We will make sure through our defense fund that there's that kind of due process, the benefit of the doubt that you can have if you are a member of the AFT. Big speech. And literally the next several days, you know, the 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 spear, the spear. Why that why that? Because the fear, and Rot just said this, I mean, just the if there's anything that you remember from me for tonight, be courageous in community don't do it alone be courageous in community don't be silent we used to have this see a bully you know stop a bully but the fear is there and even with collective bargaining contracts throughout florida because by the way collective bargaining is in the florida constitution which is why DeSantis can't simply strip it away, he has to do all these different, various different uh, attempts. So teachers are really changing their curriculum. Not all of them. Someone in New York City is not changing their curriculum. We, are, we have a group of people who we call um, uh, the Disinformation Project. And by the way, for any of you who are teachers, we have loads of curriculum, something called Share My Lesson. It's free for everyone. And we use that as a guide for people. But one of the teachers from Texas, who's in this community of teachers trying to figure out how we put curriculum on Share My Lesson to help fight disinformation, told a story that she could not use the word slavery in the Dallas school system. So we're not, okay, so we're not talking about the impact of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the word slavery, a historical fact. So that's, so, so the real question becomes, what's the slippery slope? How do we stop it? How do we create enough courage to stop it? And that's what we're working on now at the AFT. And I think that the, the, the working with parents and community groups and teachers and the broader community is the most important way of stopping it. And frankly, people are with us on all of these issues but they don't think they are because the other side is really loud. And in the 10 or 12 states where they have a trifecta, they can move something regardless of what the public sentiment is. So that's why 
why am I here today? Creating community amongst and with each other. The issue about AP is I'm stammering here because, and I said this to Kim last night, I think, think I said it to all of you yesterday. I, I went back to look at my curriculums. I taught AP Gov. I taught the We the People competition. My, I taught at Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn, New York from 1991 to 1997. So this summer as a thought experiment, I went back to my lesson plans which I still have mm -hmm. in my binders. And I would say half of what I taught, I, in the 90s, I could not teach under DeSantis's um, rules today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is much beyond the issue of how we analyze the impact of racism. This is simply them actually doing what they accuse us of doing, a very different kind of indoctrination about what they want to see as the future of the country. Randy, I just appreciate you naming that courage is both, it's an emotion, but it's also, it's a union, it's a collectivity, yeah. it's a process, a structure, solidarity. It's not just being fearless individually. We have a little ditty in our union. Together, we can accomplish what is impossible alone. Mm -hmm. It really matters now to be um, together in the collective. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, Kim, let's turn to you here. And, you know, which one I kind of two things. One is a lot of the, this kind of now response has been just a question of, again, misunderstanding. Well, authors are going here, they're not going there. All, all of these processes are always subject to revision. Um, you know, it, this is kind of much ado about nothing. And I think what this, again, takes away attention from is the content, the substance. What are the patterns of those excisions? What do they stand in for? So I hope you can talk about that and, you know, have us think about a current moment, a student who might come to the class with questions about the world they're encountering and what they could and could not be told is uh, allowable. Yeah. Um, thank you, Danny. And, and, and maybe we can uh, pull the slide back up and look at the pattern of the things that have been uh, excised. Um, one of the things to remember is that the basic objective of the far right that has now moved to the center is to make racism unspeakable, um, to erase the histories and the contemporary consequences of those histories, right? Um, so um, our our what we read in looking at the objectives is the extent to which the objectives that have been erased are those things that counter the basic objective of the far right, right, in this thing. So look at what is no longer part of, uh, of the course. And, and it's really hard to figure out what the pedagogical um, or, I mean, there's a lot of conversation about primary and secondary materials. We'll talk about that in a minute. A lot of, you know, conversation uh, about what's required and what is not. But this is telling us what are some of the objectives that can no longer um, are, are not part of this course. And one of the things that you see is um, unspeaking uh, structural and institutional racism, right? Uh, unspeaking the idea that the project uh, isn't over, the project has a future to it. The, 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 the idea that we should be thinking about these issues and preparing students uh, to make reasoned arguments to advance the, the interests of equity and democracy for the future, that's taken out as well. So, so let's think about that, what that means for a contemporary moment. Let's say we're in a conversation and uh, Tyree Nichols comes up um what is it that teachers can teach about that that allows students to understand that um racism and police brutality is not simply a matter of prejudiced people who um who hate black people there's a lot of that 
But, <laughs> but that is not what empowers police to consistently do this since 2020 the rate of killing of black people has actually gotten has gone up rather than down so what is it that one would have to understand well some of that question is what critical race theory has looked at critical race theory comes out of african american studies and other ethnic studies i was a african american studies major at cornell university my sense of what i went to law school to do is to understand how law helped facilitate all the things I learned about in undergrad. So part of the disavowal that we see at the core of this, and I'll say that some of the disavowal comes from advocates for the course who say, don't worry, this isn't critical race theory. What are you saying about um, what critical race theory is? Well, I'll say, something about what it is with respect to what students might not be able to learn. They might not be able to learn that one of the reasons that police brutality visits itself so frequently upon Black communities is because constitutional law has been interpreted to permit police officers to pull over people for minor traffic infractions without probable, uh, with, without non-racial explanations, right? It has allowed them uh, to increase the exposure of African-Americans uh, to, to police encounters. Where the exposure is increasing, so do the consequences of that. That is a structural dimension of, of police brutality that you might not be able to learn about when the basic rules say, A, you can't talk about structural dimensions, either because they don't exist, so therefore it's a not it's not a legitimate topic, or viewpoint-based orientation to it. Yes, it exists, and it's a bad thing. That's supposedly something um, that these laws are not letting us talk about. So the problem here is twofold. Number one, um, the distortion uh, and the defamation uh, and the distancing of critical race theory, first of all. Um, and, and, and the second problem is basically acclimating, uh, 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 adopting this uh, as part of what is now uh, being framed as a, a long awaited important moment that was made possible by uh, the Black Lives Matter mobilization in the 2020s. So think about it. Even the college board says, we thought this was a good opportunity to make this course possible after many years of languishing because there was so much demand, because it was so obvious people wanted to understand it, because of the contemporary consequences of that past. That was the condition of its possibility. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that's not in it is Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. The thing that can't be talked about is structural racism. The thing that people have to say, no, that's not this, is critical race theory. So this is sort of the politics of reform, retrenchment, uh, progression, disavowal. What we have to worry about is the logics that make those of us who, who truly believe in the power and the importance of Black studies, who truly believe in the power and value of education to go along with the program, whether intentional or not, and not realize the destruction that this will facilitate for the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Kim, I just want to, you know, because you, you remind us constantly, critical race theory is also a practice and it's a longstanding practice that preceded a group of scholars naming the concept. Yes. So what you're saying there is students that come in and say, you know what, I actually want to spend some time in this Fourth Amendment. I want to try to think why, in spite of all the proliferation of these rights, this is what's happening right. when I look around and see. Right. And the and, prohibition and, is no, you can't. And this do that. is precisely this is precisely the the, the project of um, uh, conservative in, insistence on colorblindness, mm -hmm. right? So uh, critical race theory actually recognizes colorblindness as a race conscious ideology. It's basically saying where there are racial predeterminants where there are distributed consequences of legal rules, where it impacts uh, people of color differently than white people because of the structures that already are there, 
These are the things that cannot be taught. These are the things that cannot be talked about because why? We're supposed to be colorblind. So the real racial problem is being aware of this history and talking about its contemporary consequence. The racial problem, according to the right, is that awareness, not the fact that it exists. And that that disciplining is not just going to happen in a government class, you know, where am I there? It's going to happen in African American history, that, that, that consciousness, right? You know? Race consciousness is not permissible in African American history, and anti racism is not permissible. Um, we're, let's turn now. Um, we have uh, uh, just two more rounds, uh, and especially we want to get to. Can sure, I go ahead. Say, Thank you, Randy. Just punctuate the point, punctuate the point about what are they afraid of? This is a conversation about race and racism and how to, what it means and how to actually look at what has happened, not only the country, but the world. Why are they so afraid of the awareness? Mm -hmm. That's, I just, I didn't mean to interrupt, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. just like, that is, what's happening in America right now. Yeah, because with the awareness is the expectation that something should be done about it. Exactly. And if you're against doing anything about it, the first thing you want to do is erase the awareness. Exactly. Yeah. And actually in the quote that they cited from Rod's work, it's because he said, we have to call our attention to systems of injustice. That's a prima facie evidence of something that's been wrong. Um, okay, in, in our last few moments, um, so we're gonna just put a slide up, uh, but we're actually, well, we won't do a full round of commenting on it. This is a slide uh, staff went through also to find mentions of topics. We're also not gonna do the video. Uh, topics that were included in the original curriculum, um, but were then taken out. And I'll, and I'll just talk them and then we're gonna turn to a, a, a kind of quick question on history. So the uh, kind of column on the left lists the mentions of the term in the original document, which itself was only 81 pages. On the right is the revised full 234 page document. Intersectionality from 15 to one, feminist from 10 to three, institutional racism four to zero. Of course, in African-American history that doesn't talk about, that doesn't use the word institutional racism. Reparations, a single mention, and Black Lives Matter, a single mention. And many on the right hand column are actually assigned to an optional section of essentially essay topics and original research, rather than a point of required curriculum. I actually want to have us um, think about some of the historic and I think we can all reflect on what it means and what students might expect going into a class, thinking that these are legitimate topics of study only to be told that's you're, you're not going to encounter that here. To think about some of the historic uh, kind of context and preconditions. So, uh, Kim, I, I want to just turn this back to you. We're going to do this in a quicker round. Okay. So, inviting just a minute or two from everyone before we get to the kind of what is to be done. So, in these moments of crisis, it's often helpful to think about historically what does this remind you of? Not that it's the same thing. But what are the linkages and continuities you see? I want to start that with you, Kim. Um, and, and, and you know, there's obviously a period of McCarthyism is something that comes to mind. But but we can explore the kind of breadth of what that meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, well. What comes to mind, you know, obviously is uh, the way in which uh, uh, civil rights movement, black uh, uh, liberty movements have uh, across history uh, been framed as anti-American, as uh, unspeakable. Uh, those who were um, uh, seen as uh, uh, radical uh, were, were basically framed as communists, right? Uh, red baiting and race baiting have gone hand in hand you know, uh, uh, across history, right? Um, so some of, of, of recovering where we might have been had that not happened is what some of the newer uh, uh, disciplinary projects were all about. Um, one of the things that we've done together is is a book on seeing race again, in which we, you know, talk about how um, the knowledge production industry that we are all in uh, was not separate and apart uh, from uh, from the racial order. It helped 
uh, uh, prop it up. It gave it uh, rationality. It uh, reproduced all of the basic assumptions that those who were on the bottom were supposed to be on the bottom, either because of psychology, because of uh, culture, because of uh, work ethic, because of lack of political participation. These disciplines help to rationalize. So part of what critical thinking has been that African American studies has been a part of, uh, as Rod said, a foundational moment in, has looked at how the disciplines themselves have been the container for the logics uh, of racial subordination. So yes, we have colored outside the lines because the lines themselves are a product of racial power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That That is what Africana Studies was about. That is what uh, critical race theory has been about. So when, when these frameworks um, that help make sense out of uh, the facts, look, history is not just an assortment of fun facts. <laughs> And Afri African American studies is not just a snapshot uh, of people in different disciplines. It's gathering all this stuff together around a theory. And the theory is we are equal. Mm -hmm. And our material inequality is an intolerable set of conditions. That is what the point is. And, 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 and this is effectively removing the frameworks that allow the delivery uh, of of that lesson of that um, uh, acknowledgement, uh, and with it comes the exclusion of all sorts of experiences that continue to shape our lives today. Um, I'm going to just turn to Rod, and, and just we're, we'll take a couple of minutes, and then turn to this kind of question of um, where we go from here. Rod, you've mentioned the lavender scare as another kind of historic uh, correlate. Could you tell us what that is and what thinking with that moment um, yeah. and its aspirations might illuminate about this time? Yeah, I mean, the lavender scare was, um, you know, at the beginning of the Cold War, the end of the 40s, around 47, part of the McCarthy period. It was the moment in which the government went after actual and suspected queer folks, right? for being security risks, that they could be easily manipulated by the Soviet Union uh, and anti-American forces within this country. Um, I think that, you know, that genealogy intersects with what Kim is also talking about, right, in terms of the uh, way in which the government went after, uh, you know, black progressives, you know, Langston Hughes, uh, Alice Childress, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, you know? Um, we see an intersection there with the Red Scare and also with, you know, the sort of uh, targeting of Black progressive artists and thinkers, especially in, you know, something like, you know, um, not just Black queer studies, but Black, the attack on Black queer studies as an anxiety about the way in which the Black Lives Matter movement made queerness and transness part of its idiom. And I remember in um, hearing about the Black Lives Matter movement when it was first starting, and it was on the PBS NewsHour, and there was a Black guy, coded as straight, who said, quote, we are not, you know, your grandparents' civil rights movement. We're queer, you know, we are uh, people who believe in reparations. We believe in redistribution. And I remember getting out of the chair saying, holy shit, you know, like here is, you know, the sort of modern version of the civil rights movement. And you've got this guy who's coded as straight avowing queerness, all right? You know, so this goes back to the awareness point, you know, uh, if there's an, an engagement, if there's an awareness, even those formations and identities that the conservatives thought they had in their pocket may be lost to them, you know? And I think that's the scare, right? Again, what kinds of people might the midwife bring into the world, you know? And, and, and that analytic is so important because 
as you're saying, the, the lavender scare is not just about discrimination, mm -hmm. right? Just difference or, you know, bigotry and tolerance. It's because they were the bearers and most likely to be the bearers of whole sets of critiques that could expand out. And there's something, you know, quite, and part of, you know, McCarthyism is the disavowal. Mm -hmm. You know, they seem to be going after them. I'm not, I gotta keep my head down. I'm not gonna, you know. And, and, and that practice, that practice of disavowal is part of our, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is why it's like, you know, Rand is important point, right? Like, how do we socialize courage? Yeah. Mm. You know, how do you do that? Because again, what we're faced in this moment is the social reproduction of cowardice, you know? People not finding their voice when they should be finding their voice, you know? How do we create models by which people can speak the unspeakable, you know? And feel moved by that, that's and solidarity, right? It. That's you at your best, yeah. Exactly right, you are at your highest, your best self, yeah. when you are standing up yeah. for what's right. Yeah. Um, Randy, let's turn to you about this question now about kind of histories we might recall. And again, this gets us to why an attack on public goods, uh, public sector unions, unions themselves, is not haphazard, it's not a coincidence. A lot of the history that's being disciplined is about the kind of black insurgency as it relates to the economy, to workers, to unions, to their critiques of um, the way work is organized. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that as a, a certain kind of inheritance right. that, you know, the, the teachers draw on today. In two minutes. In two minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do two quick stories that I think will do it. One is what has gotten missed in, because there's a whole lot of historical context here. I'm, it's been curious to me in listening that the historical context has been about the United States. Yeah. I mean, Kristallnacht, the burning of books, the going from um the rhetoric to the incitement um remember desantis's hero is victor orban um who actually and i would just throw out to you for those of you who haven't read it the book how democracies die because many of these autocrats actually use the democratic power and then uh use it um gerrymandering that's why the right to vote and the enfranchisement is so important but let me just say that in this, one of the conversations I've had with College Board is their treatment of not just Bayard Rustin, but A. Philip Randolph, who is an, you know, who was the most important African American labor leader. And they give him not only just a passing reference, but don't actually talk about that importance. And, the, and Bayard is talked about through his identity as gay, as opposed to a really important labor leader. Mm -hmm. And yes, he was erased in many ways because of his gayness or queerness, um, and the history of him was erased. But I, I would actually argue that the, this, the, the, even the original didn't do justice to the intersectionality of economic justice and racial justice. You know you can't say that word one more time, right? <laughs> Only once. <laughs> once. So, and, and, and the last thing I would say, and the, my second story, I'll wait for the close in terms of what to do. The second story I would say is that what teachers now feel about the historical context is like, how do you, this happened last week. Many of us were talking on Saturday. Can I curse in this room? We already have. Oh shit. <laughs> how are we gonna teach this video on Monday? What are we going to do? What advice can we give? What are we gonna put on share my lesson? So it's gonna be out there. And that same conversation was how, and, and that's not even the pain of it or the processing of it. How are we gonna teach it? How are we gonna answer questions? How are we gonna answer questions about what happened in Buffalo? 
how are we going to do this? How are we going to answer the why? How, what are we going to talk about? And those kind of, so, so, so the historical context is important, but it's like real life every single day that teachers are going through trying to navigate these politics and their all sense, their whole sense of moral courage and judgment about what we need to do to help the kids be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I just, you know, Kim has made this point that when you say, what, what are we gonna do? The figure that's invoked is not the thousands, hundreds of thousands of creative teachers who have amazing ideas about what can be done. It's the lowest common denominator. It's DeSantis, right? And allies that are controlling the answer to that question. That's who's in the mind. Not all that could be done, right? But behind that. Paul, let's just, we're gonna to turn to you quickly. We're gonna go a little past um, uh, our, our time because we uh, uh, started a bit late. Paul, you remind us that when we talk about history, when we talk about what's, what's you know, come past, it's not just a generation ago. Sometimes it's a very recent past. And the ability to control information, to offer a dominant narrative that can't be contested is something you've struggled with, you and your colleagues in Florida. And I'm hoping you can say a little bit more about that, especially as it relates to the kind of COVID period. Dan, I love the question, and I love the formulation that Roderick shared with us earlier, the, this wonderful, meaningful phrase, the social reproduction of cowardice. You know, we're, we're doing our jobs here in Florida. We're, we're in the trenches. Randy was just here, and she knows that teachers and faculty, parents and students, we're in this for the long haul. We are in, we, you know, we're in the front lines against DeSantis. Everyone knows that. And I do a lot of panels nationwide. Um, I'm working on a project with Ibram Kendi right now on unearthing the, the origins of inequality in the United States. But my, my question, I'm just gonna kind of turn the question around if you don't mind and, and ask people in the audience, what are you doing? Um, because I know what we're doing here in Florida. We are organizing for the long haul. We're organizing to defend intellectual freedom. We're organizing to, to defend the rights of people to speak their conscience. We're organizing for the rights of our students to take any damn class they wanna take, whether it's on global climate change, African-American studies, gender studies. By the way, these are all things that the state of Florida has attacked. We're also under attack, Dan, in terms of DEI. That's been alluded to earlier, but I wanna to touch on that briefly. Our staff here in Florida, not just in education, but in all fields are under siege now because as, as many of you know, Governor DeSantis is targeting staff who teach or who work to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in the public sector in Florida. Think about that for a minute. These goals, these ideals that every church, mosque, and synagogue in the United States of America supports, that most corporations even support, are under siege in Florida. Now, and again, we're fighting, we're in the trenches, but again, what I want to know is what everyone else is doing, because if you think you're remote from this struggle, dear colleagues or friends in the audience, I, I can't see you right now, but I feel the love. If you think you're removed from this, you are not. This is coming for you. And the reason that this is spreading is because there's been too much apathy. There's been too much, well, you know, we feel really bad for those people in Florida and Texas, but thank God I'm in Connecticut or Massachusetts. We need to get out of that mindset right now. This is a national emergency. This is a national crisis. And again, we're digging our heels in, in Florida for the long haul, but we want to know what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul, that reminder that this is not, there's no uh, safe place for you to hide and duck where you'll be exempt from this is so important. And we're going to keep that with us as we just go into our last round of both reflections and activations. Um, I'm going to start with you, Rod. Um, you know, you've written about student social movements, you've taught, you've taught students who are incarcerated, taught K through 12 teachers, taught, you know, uh, higher ed and, and many places in the country. What's w w thinking with those traditions? What what what's giving you kind of energy and hope and possibility? Yeah. All right. So two things. Um, you know, in the 1975 speech at Portland State, Toni Morrison said, "The very serious function 
of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work, okay? And so that, right? So this is a moment to return to the work, not to retreat from the work, because you know there are forces that are trying to intimidate us out of our work. You know, so for me, it is about refortifying myself as a teacher, a writer, an advisor, you know, the people that give me hope, you know, the K through 12 teachers that I have taught, you know, who, you know, I sent the reporter contacting me on Saturday, Sunday, they sent flowers to the house, <laughs> the K through 12 teachers did. And what did they say on the note? We got your back. Okay. Um, you know, the students who showed up on mass you know, uh, to Friday's teaching at Yale, you know, one of the students came up to me and said, uh, African American guy said, you know, I want you to know that I wish you courage. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you in the work that you're doing. I want you to continue to do that work. I pray for your strength. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, the students, my students are the ones who uh, demanded the Black Feminist Theory course when I first got there. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be a course of like 10 students and then 35 students showed up. So I just let everybody in. Mm -hmm. The Queer and Trans course, it was 10 students who showed up in 2019 when I first started teaching at Yale. And because of student demand, it's 120 students mm -hmm. now, you know? So the students are hungry. They are um, ready for this moment. They feel that they are also called for such a time as this. You know, so let's meet them. Yeah. yeah. And Rod, you know, you're, you're saying, right, in that moment of uncertainty, there's that one voice that says, how am I gonna kind of protect myself mm -hmm. and what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. And then there's another possibility, mm -hmm. right? Who am I called to defend? Who am I called to speak up for? Mm -hmm. How does my job as a counselor, a teacher, a whole range of things, how does it shift in this moment? Yeah. What am I called to do now? What's the vocation now? Yeah, it can be a moment of clarification. Yeah. You know, in many ways, the DeSantis uh, response is confirmation that we're doing it right. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's confirmation that we're doing it right. You know? Um, and, you know, I would encourage us to think of this as a moment of mobilization mm -hmm. and opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, to again reorganize knowledge, you know. Right. And the long traditions we have to draw from. The long traditions right. we have to draw from. We do not come empty handed at this moment. That's right. That's right. Um, Paul, we're going to turn to you one last time. I, I know you're quite literally thinking about your next day of meetings, <laughs> rallies, and organizing. So just give us a quick snapshot. What's giving you hope? What's on the ground? What's the, the, the moments of solidarity and the energy that, that, that are feeding you right now? Well, what's giving me hope, Dan, is, is this meeting tonight. And equally important is our students, younger people, high school kids, parents, all over Florida. We mentioned DeSantis's takeover of New College earlier, but also what's equally important is that the alumni of that college, the students, the parents are mobilizing against that takeover even as we speak. We also had a teach-in on Monday at the University of Florida. We welcomed our brand new president, uh, who, former Republican Senator from Nebraska. And our students are insistent that we're going to hold Ben Sass accountable to these values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The University of Florida, Dan, was founded as an all-white, all-male, all-Protestant institution. Governor DeSantis doesn't want you to know that. He wants us to all pretend that we all were equal at the outset. That's a lie. That's a myth. So the thing that gives me hope is exactly what Roderick just said. Um, when I opened my labor history class, my African diaspora in the Americas class, uh, all those classes filled the first day now. Younger people are hungry for knowledge. They're hungry for having these conversations about what are we going to do about mass incarceration? What are we going to do about transphobia? 
what are we going to do about the oppression of undocumented workers in Florida and other states? Every school district I work with, Dan, and, and it's several across the country, it's the high school students who are demanding these new conversations. And this is why African American studies is absolutely central to this struggle. And again, borrowing from what Roderick said earlier, this is why we're under siege. This is the, this is the kind of the empire strikes back, as my students remind me, a moment where the empire sees these threats at the base from the younger generations connecting to the older generations. That's us. I'm getting older. We're all getting older, right? Um, but we're, we're, we're being effective. We're, we're changing things. And this is what the state's trying to shut down. So we need to fight to keep these spaces open. And remember, we have allies. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Paul. You know, you're far away from us on one hand, but we feel you right here tonight and your voice and your um, energy and we're with you. Um, we're gonna turn to Randy and then Kim. Randy, I know you have this exhausting schedule from place to place to place. And people might think it's, you know, you're just seeing, it's on one hand crisis after crisis, but you also get to see people at their best. You get to see teachers fighting, fighting, fighting for the learning conditions of their students and their communities and the reading specialists and the people taking care of the schools. You get to see all of that, right? A profound vision of care. Um, can you um, talk to us about what, what part of that um, we might be inspired by and take with us? So, um, first off, what gives me hope are people like the people in this room that you're here. What gives me hope are people like Paul. Mm -hmm. I get to work with, I get to represent people like Paul all the time. I get to represent um, teachers who are doing this work all the time. And that's a pretty awesome, amazing gift that I get. But I want to actually take it to one other point, which is going back to what Roderick said about the social reproduction of cowardice. Cowardice. cowardice and the opposite of what we need to do. Um, for me, look, I'm a labor activist and I'm a school teacher and I'm a lawyer. So I look at everything in terms of organizing and the race that we're in between hope and fear, despair and aspiration. And I think about what is the actionable, what, what is the feature of hope that's recognizable, that's actionable, action. And so I kind of leave you with this something that right after the 19 right after trump won um in night in 2016. for those of you who don't know my right wife is a congregational rabbi cbst gay queer i mean we're very open we let people who are straight come to the shul now <laughs> 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 but the but the Right after that election, she called the Inman from the Islamic Center at NYU, said, can we come? And we rushed and that Friday, the, the rabbis and me, it was Veterans Day, so I got to go with them. We brought tons and tons of roses. We, of course, did not take the um, uh, pins off of them. Or the, um, but we were outside, these Jews, outside the Islamic Center with signs that we wrote in the subway, says, your Jewish neighbors welcome you and honor you. And people initially walked into them and, and were, who are these people? What are they doing? Fast forward to the, and every Friday before COVID, the synagogue, there's a group of people that went, and now it's once a month. I see people shaking their heads, they know the story. After the um, shooting in Pittsburgh, the first call Sharon got was from the same woman, Iman, saying, we want to come to the shul this Friday. That sense of community and courage 
sends messages to everyone that if we are working on this together, we can change things. Mm -hmm. They will survive in Florida, just like we beat Betsy DeVos in Detroit when she tried to take that school system. And look what has now happened in Michigan in terms of elections, elections matter. The same thing in Pennsylvania. Yesterday, we won the investment case in Pennsylvania. And yesterday, there was a special election where Pennsylvania now has a Democratic House. The work we have to do together to do the work is really important. You all can do something. None of us can do everything. But we all can do something that starts with showing up for each other. Well, Randy, you know, I, I think part of what I just, you know, get from the story is that these the possibilities of those forms of solidarity, they're always present, you know, and they have to be practiced and exercised like a muscle. You can't wait for some time down the road. And you've just, you know, given us such a vivid example of that. Um, Kim, we're gonna turn to you, you know, to wrap it up. The African American Policy Forum is engaged in lots of lots of work that activates and extends this, and you know, invite you to talk about that. But where are we going from here? Yeah. Well, you know, I I think we're finally at a point where there is uh, an awareness that uh, we cannot outrun um, this anti woke cabal by disavowing um, our values. We cannot continue to think that we can save our democracy while we allow anti-racism to be shrunk. Um, we um, uh, cannot continue to accommodate um, the, uh, the forces that have now uh, taken over in some state legislatures uh, to try to impose an agenda uh, that is an extremist, um, anti-inclusion, anti-democratic agenda. And there's no reason that we should have to, the majority actually, when you explain what is happening, we have found in even um, our research, when you tell people uh, what they're really going after when they attack critical race theory, when you tell people, when you define it, people are on our side. And that's basically what the midterms should have taught us. It should have taught us that the, the, the great boogie man that everyone's afraid of and they're accommodating and bowing to, one does not have to do it. We do not have to give up our power. We do not have to give up generations of knowledge. We do not have to give up the energy that created this moment, right? 2020 could have changed everything if we'd stayed the course, right? But we allowed ourselves to be cowed into bowing down uh, to anti-wokeism. And one of the things that I, I have to I have to always think Derek Bell told us this when he talked about interest convergence, he always said um, that that our freedom doesn't come because uh, uh, the, the, the forces of power think, oh, gee, why didn't you say it that way before? Um, now we're going to give it to you. It, it comes because interests converge. When interests no longer converge, that's when we have to fight the most. Mm -hmm. So interests converged uh, around the aftermath of George Floyd and the College Board's desire uh, to create uh, an, an AP course in African American Studies. And let me just be clear, um, advanced placement courses are the, the moneymaker now for uh, the College Board with the SAT no longer being the thing that all colleges and universities look to. And, African American studies was, uh, you know, an opportunity for them, right? It was an opportunity for us. So that's a good thing. But then that hit the buzzsaw of anti wokeism. And so when those things came together, what we got out of it was a course that could fit within anti wokeism. In other words, states that don't want to have the full treatment, states that don't want to allow their students to opt in um, to courses that would teach them about structural racism and intersectionality and, and queer theory and black feminist literary theory, they can have the course. 
-hmm. Unlike if you want to have a course on biology and take out evolution, no, they don't allow that. So they'll allow you to take out structural racism from a course on African American, but not uh, with respect to other other courses. We can't allow this to happen because if this works, if this institution falls, then there really isn't a barricade that's going to keep other institutions from doing the same thing and trust. This is coming to higher education as well. It already is in higher education. We heard Paul talk about it in Florida. It, 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 it's already in Iowa. It's already in Texas. There's even an effort to deny tenure to teachers who teach this material. So it, it's up to us to basically say enough is enough. And unfortunately, a lot of these conversations are going to be without allies and friends. We're, we're never going to convince the DeSantis's of the world, but it's our friends that we need to have the tough conversations with. It's our friends that we have to say, look, we're not casting any dispersions upon your character or your commitment, but we're saying tactically, strategically, what you're doing is a mistake. It's a mistake for us and it's a mistake for our democracy. So what I'm excited about is that when we get to people, and show them what's happening, they actually go, okay, now I understand. So one of the things that we did this fall, um, and I wanna end with uh, this, um, it's a good walking out video. Um, we uh, had an unbanned book tour, we called it from Freedom uh, Writers to Freedom Readers. And the idea was um, just like they didn't get to tell us where to sit, where to eat, where to drink back then, they don't get to tell us what to read, what to teach, what to learn right now. So we passed out all of the books that we could get our hands on that were banned books and showed people exactly what's in the books that they don't want people to know. And it just so happens that the same states that are banning books are the same states that are banning our votes. What do they have to do with each other, I wonder? right? You cannot participate in this democracy if you don't have literacy around what this place is about. And that's what our band book tour is about. So maybe we can play it. Uh, and yeah, well, take yeah, let me, I'll just do our, our quick thank yous. And I, and I first want to start, Kim, you from the start three years ago when this first happened said, we ignore this at our peril. And you've been patient with many, many folks to invite them into those conversations. So I'm grateful for that to the African American Policy Forum. Just give me a moment to thank our co-sponsors, the Institute for Research in African American Studies. Uh, African American and African Diaspora Studies at Columbia, the Black Students Law Association at Columbia, all my colleagues and friends at the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective in Connecticut, and our friends at New Haven Federation of Teachers. Um, and I, and I, I first just want you to uh, join me in thanking these amazing panelists and to Paul for all the insights from tonight. join us. The same people who were upset when we took to the streets in all 50 states after the murder of George Floyd are the same people who have decided that they want to take the language of structural racism, of racial injustice, of social justice out of our mouths, out of our studies, out of our books. We have decided that just like the Freedom Riders who said, you don't get to tell us where to sit, you don't get to tell us where to eat, you don't get to tell us what to drink, we have decided you don't get to tell us what to read, you don't get to tell us what to teach, you don't get to tell us what to learn. So what we've done is decided to give 6,000 books away, all of the titles that they don't want us to learn. So what we want you to do is help yourself to books that we have brought here for you. We want you to join us as freedom readers. This connects our history of fighting for our right 
to be our right to be part of this democracy, our right to exercise power, and we know the people who do not know their history are what? They're bound to repeat it. Well, I know about me, I'm not willing to repeat the history of losing our political power. I'm not willing to repeat the history of having our stories erased from textbooks. I'm not about to repeat the history where they tell us where to go and what to do. It is the difference between our fight for black excellence and the reality of a world that doesn't want to see that happen. We're going to make sure that this nation feels the heat, feels the passion, feels the impact of the black vote. So yes, black voters matter. Yes, black books matter. Black voters matter. Black books matter. Black voters matter. Black books matter. See you November 8th. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And one final announcement on February 15th, keep your lookout for a briefing and call to action for African American studies sponsored by the African American Polity Forum. It'll give us orientation and direction. It's February 15th, 7pm. Go to the AAPF's website to find out more. Thank you, everyone.